Hey, well, that was a, a happy story. And if it's okay with you, um, I, I have a scary story to share with you um, this morning, just to kind of update you on my life a little bit. I just got back uh, from London. I, I was there for school. Um, and actually, maybe that's the scary part for some of you, going back to school as an adult. You know, maybe that's scary in and of itself. But um, I, was, I was in London, and I, I was staying in, in West London, which is kind of like, as the British would say, like a, like a posh area. Um, but then I, I, I wanted to go and kind of have a day just to explore the center of the city. So I booked an Airbnb um, kind of off center of the city. How many of you have ever stayed in an Airbnb before? Have you ever stayed in an Airbnb? So I, uh, so I take the train, um, sort of going into town, and I message my Airbnb host, trying to figure out, um, you know, what's going on, agree for a meeting time to get the keys, and he asks me to meet him uh, 25 minutes away, further outside the city from my Airbnb, and I'm like, hmm, kind of weird, but hey, it's got five stars, no big deal, I'll do this, so I take the train and go to this stop, which is kind of outside the center of the city, and I get out of the train, and I am surrounded by strong, scary-looking men. And I'm like, you know, I don't, I don't feel safe right now. <laughs> and looking around, it's like, I mean, it is, I mean, I'm sure many of us have been in areas of cities where I was like, this is not the safe part of town. This is the scary part of town. And I kind of look at my phone to see where I'm supposed to meet this guy. Hopefully he's just like right there and I can get it and go. And the place he wants me to meet him is still a 10 minute walk away from the train station through the neighborhood. And so I'm like, five stars, I got this, we can do this. And I go and every mom in the room is like, why didn't you get back on the train? <laughs> And I'm like, I got this, like, we can do this. So I go, and I mean, I'm dressed like in my nice conference clothes. I have all my luggage. And then there's just these mean, surly glares. And I'm walking 10 minutes through the neighborhood. Um, and then I get to this one street where I'm supposed to meet the guy. And every business on the street is shuttered and closed, except for this one janky little office building where I'm supposed to meet this person. So I go up to it. And there's two men there. Um, and I say, hey, I'm here for my Airbnb. And they don't know who I am. And so I show them my booking, like, hey, and then they kind of talk amongst themselves in a language that um, was not English, so I did not understand it. Um, and then they look at me, and they're like, sit down, your host is coming. And they open the door for me to go inside their office, and I'm like, hey, five stars, why not? So I go in, <laughs> sit down, and they close the door, and the guy's out, one guy goes upstairs, and then the other guy walks back out front because he was, like, cleaning the windows. And then I see him move his ladder so it's blocking the door. And I'm like, okay. And then I see the blood on the wall. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I'm sitting there and I'm like, I do not feel safe right now in this moment. You know, I don't want these guys to know where I am tonight. I would rather just book a hotel. Like, we're not doing this Airbnb thing right now. So I, I stand up to go leave. The guy hops off the ladder and is like, sit down, your host is coming. And I'm just scared, so I sit down. <laughs> I'm like, okay, this is not good. I mean, just preview. I mean, I do get out alive, don't worry, like, if you were worried about that. But I'm sitting there. And I'm just processing what's going on. And finally, I mean, I was there. I mean, it was just scary. I was there for like 10 minutes, just literally in shock, processing what's going on. And finally, I cannot do this. So I open the door, step over the ladder, and I'm like, thank you so much. Thanks for your time. I'm going to go book a hotel. Walk down the block. The guy chases me two blocks down the street. And uh, I think what he was trying to do is I think he was trying to get me to talk on the phone to my host who wasn't there yet. But... How many of you know you never chase somebody down the street? So at that moment, I was done. I made it into a safer area of the city. I just walked down the street till it was safe again um, and found an awesome hotel um, to stay at. So I don't know what would have happened. I don't know if I was going to get mugged. I think really likely they were going to try and like taxi me over to my Airbnb and get me to use my credit card and then like um, steal my identity or something. But I am okay. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. So, and I hope that you're happy as well. So. Um, but it's kind of convenient, though, because we're actually going to talk about um, identity theft this morning and how there's a thief. Come on, watch this. This is good. There's a thief 
that comes to steal, kill, and destroy our identity. But the question we're going to ask this morning is, are we getting our identity from our circumstances and struggles, or are we getting our identity from our Savior? So let's pray this morning. Why don't you close your eyes? Lord, we thank you so much for your presence that's already in this room. Lord, thank you for the breakthrough and worship of baptisms. And Lord, we just pray that you would open our hearts and open our minds this morning. Lord, we just declare this morning, there's some things that where you are, Jesus, they're not welcome in the room. God, you're the king of kings. So Lord, we just pray where anxiety and stress are. God, we say those things are not welcome in your presence because you're the prince of peace. Just with eyes closed, how many of you are saying, you know, I I got some anxiety and stress that I need to leave at the door this morning. Just slip your hand up. I want to pray for you. Lord, thank you that you are the Prince of Peace this morning. God, every financial burden and stress, God, we thank you. You are the provider. It's who you are. So, Lord, we command even shoulder tension and all those things and stresses to be relaxed right now in the name and authority of Jesus. Anyone? I, I just really sense this. Is there anyone who's going through a significant financial struggle? Right now, just slip your hand up if that's you, Lord. We pray for peace in minds, God. We command even those worrying late nights where there's not sleep, God. We ask for peaceful sleep in the name and authority of Jesus, God. We say you are the provider. It's who you are. So, Lord, come and move in our hearts this morning in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we're going to be going back and forth this morning between Hebrews 11 and Genesis 32. If you want to open up your Bibles uh, to Hebrews 11 first, and then we're going to hop over to Genesis uh, 32. And we're just going to dive right in this morning. We're in a series called Redefining Faith. And we've been going through some heroes of the faith in in Hebrews chapter 11, Abraham. uh, I think we did Joseph last week. And we're going to look at one hero of the faith. And we've been talking about how each of them have been redefining what faith looks like from what we might have thought faith was or what culture might say faith is. And this morning, we're going to look at this guy named Jacob. And here's how the the author of Hebrews um, sets up the story of Jacob. He gets one verse in Hebrews 11, 21. It says, by faith... Jacob, when dying, blessed, say blessed, Blessed. each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the top of his staff. And so the Bible, Hebrews connects this idea of what's the action Jacob does by faith? Well, he blesses. And so in order to understand how Jacob's story in life redefines faith for us, um, first we have to look at, and this is the first question we're going to ask this morning, is what's going on when the Bible talks about blessing? Um, Because surprise, it's probably not what most of us actually think about when we think about blessing. So when we ask that question, what does the Bible say about blessing? We're we're actually going to go just briefly. We're going to walk through uh, the story of Genesis until we get to the story of uh, Jacob in Genesis. Because the first time the word blessing is used is actually in Genesis chapter 1. And this is the beginning of the story of the Bible, and God's creating heaven and earth. And then the first time this word blessing gets used, it's in the context of God just created humanity. He creates male and female. And then it says in Genesis 1.28, it says, God blessed them. And he says to them, be fruitful and multiply. So the first context of blessing is a word of affirmation and approval spoken by a father to sons and daughters. And so really what I would suggest, and we're going to follow this a little bit more, is that in the Bible, blessing has to do with this state of approval from God the Father. And that's what it looks like. And so it's connected to identity because if we know who our dad is, we know that we're beloved sons and daughters. And it's this blessing and this approval. And I think a lot of us would know if we we could even raise hands around the room, we know people or maybe ourselves, those of us who didn't get blessing and approval and affirmation from, from our natural dads are often the ones who have the most trouble figuring out who they are and what their identity is. But God starts off giving his kids this approval, this blessing, which is tied to their identity and confidence and their ability to do what he's asking them to do, to go fill the earth. And then um, 
And this whole thing gets broken in Genesis 3. We see Adam and Eve walking in the confidence of their approval. Adam walks in the, in the cool of the garden with God. Um, but then um, they, something gets broken, and they end up listening to the voice of that thief that we talked about a little bit ago. They listen uh, to the voice of that accuser, that enemy, that isn't giving them words of blessing, that isn't giving them words of approval. And many of us have heard that voice in our life. That voice that says, you're not loved, you're not special, you're not cared for. And they listen to that voice rather than the voice of their father, and then blessing gets broken. And here's what I want to say. It's not that God withdrew his blessing and approval. What you really see in the story is Adam and Eve stepping outside of that approval and blessing and finding their identity somewhere else. And really the question God comes and asks Adam that represents this broken blessing is Genesis 3 verse 9. It says, but the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And you can almost hear the heartbreak in the father's voice of you used to be in my blessing and in my approval, but you've taken yourself out of that. And this blessing gets broken, but then God initiates a restoration plan in Genesis 12. And he picks this guy named Abram. And in Genesis 12, verse 1, it says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred or your family and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you, I will curse and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And God reestablishes this blessing in the context of asking Abram to leave his family so that he can find himself in God's family. And then he's going to be the originator of a lot of families that come after him. And so God uh, rebuilds blessing, but again, he's defining blessing in the context of a father that's giving approval. And so Abram knows who he is. If we know who God is, we know who we are. Does this make sense this morning? This is blessing. It has to do with identity. It has to do with approval. Um, but oftentimes, that's not the first thing that we think of when we think of blessing. Um, I looked up hashtag blessed on Instagram. And well, can we just have, let's have an honest, I'm going to ask a couple just honest soul-bearing questions this morning for us to kind of get comfortable with one another as a community. And this is the first one. How many of you have used the hashtag, hashtag blessed on Instagram before? Let's see it. Thank you for your honesty. Thank you. Thank you. So if you look up, I probably, maybe I saw your post in the midst of it. I just scrolled. This isn't like an official data. I just kind of looked to see what people posted about when they say hashtag blessed. And most of the time, it was things like cars, and Ferraris, and boats, and houses. But can I tell you, and this is just my observation, what the number one thing was that people post about for hashtag blessed? Muscles. <laughs> and there's literally pictures, and I'm so sorry if you've done this, but there's literally pictures of like, <laughs> hashtag blessed biceps. And really, when we think, and this is what we're guilty of, I mean, we as Americans, oftentimes, those of us who go in America, think about blessing in the context of things. And I, I, googled, um, I, I googled the most expensive house in the world. I don't know if this is actually the most expensive house in the world, but it could be the most expensive house in the world. Can we, can we show that picture? Come on, isn't that a nice hashtag blessed house right there? <laughs> Obviously, in church, none of us would actually want to live there, but as soon as we step out the door, how many of you know secretly somewhere in our heart there's this desire, oh, I wish I could live in a place like that? Um, and, and really, you, you can take that down. But I think in, in our American Western culture, when we think about blessing, we think about things. We think about stuff. And really, we kind of believe this story that's been told to us, and you might define it as the American dream, or I don't know what you define it as, but we've been told this story that if you work hard enough, you'll be blessed. 
And if you work hard enough, you'll be able to afford a nice house and a boat and uh, no financial issues and obedient kids and no fights in your marriage and everything is awesome. And how many of you have actually heard that story be told before? If you work hard enough, you get blessed. But there's something, I don't know if you've noticed this, uh, that's not a real story. That's not an accurate story. And that idea of blessing is actually quite different than God's approval and our finding our identity in him. And, and I think a lot of us, we might say in here, well, we're Christians. Like, we don't believe if you work hard enough, you'll get blessed. But I think we as Christians, if, we, if we're honest with ourselves, uh, we have our own version of that story. And it's if you have faith, you'll be blessed. And if I'm honest, and I'm just going to be honest with you, I oftentimes find myself, and I think maybe some of us in the room do also, secretly judging people that don't have nice things or that don't have obedient kids or that have messes in their marriages saying, man, they probably just didn't have the right kind of faith. How many of us do that? Do we realize it's the same story, just with different language? I think what we need is a redefinition of what faith is and a redefinition of what blessing is. And so in America, we define faith based on our successes, but the Bible defines faith according to suffering. And in America, we get our identity, actually. We know who we are based on our successes. But here's what I want to suggest is that in the Bible, we actually get our identity in the midst of suffering. And here's how we're going to look at it. We're looking at the story of Jacob because it's by faith, faith that Jacob blessed. The question that we want to ask this morning is, um, is, is our blessing coming from times of success? Or is our blessing coming in moments of suffering? And how does Jacob demonstrate this in his life? What, what is Jacob doing? So we're going to open up uh, to Genesis 32 and dive in for, for our last few minutes here into a story about Jacob, uh, where Jacob gets the blessing in Genesis 32. And I kind of imagine this story is, a, uh, you might have heard of it before. In it, Jacob wrestles with this man at sunrise, and it's kind of this, uh, this mystical story. And, and I kind of imagine, you know, I, I don't know if you know this, but, but a lot of these stories uh, would have been initially, initially told orally. Uh, they weren't written down for quite some time. Initially, they would have been told around the dinner table, sons and daughters, or mother, mothers and fathers sharing this story with sons and daughters, or as Israel's traveling throughout the wilderness and the desert, sitting around the campfire, they'd be sharing these stories about what great-granddad Abraham went through and what great-grandpa Jacob went through. And I kind of imagine, this story is so mystical, just imagine with me for a second, uh, we're, we're sharing this story around a campfire in the wilderness, and I think this story might have been one of those stories that they would have saved for one of those nights where you stay up all night around the campfire sharing stories. And then there's that moment right before sunrise where the dew kind of settles in. And you start to see the sun peek up over the horizon. It's that sort of mystical feeling. So I want us to imagine that together as we read this, talking about great-grandpa Jacob. It says, Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. And then he said, let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And so he said to him, the man wrestling said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And then the man said, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, for I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. And then the sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. And it's this mystical story where this man shows up and Jacob wrestles all night and then uh, he gets a new name and then he asks, what's your name? And then he, he limps away and he ends up deciding that this man that he just wrestled was actually God. And I can't help but wonder if Jacob 
had grown up hearing the stories of his, fa- his, grandpa, his grandpa Abraham who got a blessing directly from God himself. And hearing the stories about Isaac who got a blessing directly from God himself. And many of us who know the story of Jacob, you don't have to know the story of Jacob, but if you do, we might remember the story of Jacob getting his blessing is kind of an interesting one. Maybe he's waiting for God himself to give him the blessing and approval that he's looking for. And so when this man shows up, he says, this is my moment. This is God coming to give me that blessing and that approval as as his son. And here's what I want to look at. I just want to pull out three things from this story. And and here's the first one, is that the context in which Jacob gets this blessing and this approval is in the middle of the struggle. And I think a lot of us maybe look for blessing in our lives, God to come and approve us and bless us after the struggle's over. But Jacob gets the blessing in the middle of the struggle. And here's what I think. I think there's some encouragement for us this morning is that there's blessing in the middle of our wrestling. There's blessing in the middle of our struggle. And I think maybe some of us are in the middle of something waiting for God to deliver us out of it. But he's saying not yet. There's a blessing that's still waiting for you in the midst of it. And we're going to redefine faith this morning. Faith isn't like working hard and doing awesome and waiting for the struggle to be over. And faith is faithfulness to God, even in the middle of struggle. Faith is faithfulness to God, even when it's hard. And that's what Jacob demonstrates for us. And, and, and really, I think a question for a lot of us, if we're honest with ourselves, there's see, all of us are going through some sort of struggle, some sort of wrestle, some sort of hardship, some sort of problem. And so the question for us this morning is, is how do we get that blessing in the middle of our struggle? How do we get that um, that, that blessing in the wrestling, if we could say it that way. How do we get that? And so Jacob does this. Here's what, here's what Jacob does. Um, it, he, he says, that the man who's wrestling Jacob says, let me go for the day is breaking. And Jacob says, I will not let you go until you bless me. And so the man wrestling says, what is your name? And he says, Jacob. And then the man says, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and humans and prevailed. Here's what his blessing looks like. It looks like a new identity. Do we remember the story from Genesis that blessing is in the context of approval, which is in the context of identity, knowing what God says about us? Jacob's blessing looks like figuring out with confidence what God's saying about him in the midst of his struggle. And oftentimes, this is what blessing looks like, is in the middle of the struggle and the wrestle, we actually get shaped and formed and molded into the people that God's calling us to be. And how does that happen? It's because when we're in the wrestle, when we're in the struggle, all that junk, if I can put it that way, deep theological term, all that junk that we don't like to talk about kind of rises to the surface. And in the middle of our hardship and wrestle, that's where the fear comes up. How many of you have fear coming up right now? That's where the anxiety and stress comes up. That's where the insecurity comes up. That's where the doubt in God comes up. And I think we are in wrestling in our life because that stuff comes to the surface so that God can scrape it away and mold us and form us into the image of his son. And that's what it looks like to get identity in the middle of struggle. It looks like God shaping and molding and forming us to look, act, and think like Jesus in the middle of wrestling. And we leave changed by that struggle. We leave changed by that struggle. I think a lot of us, we expect, um, and we can get that video clip ready, Um, I think a lot of us expect that we are going to walk out of our struggles in our challenges in life, we expect that it's gonna look something like this. And I actually realized I, when I picked it, I wasn't watching with the sound on, so I didn't know what music was playing. <laughs> And I heard it for the first time live at 9 a.m. And they voted that I keep it in for the second service. So you get the full experience there. 
But I think, I know it's silly, but if we're honest, I think that's how a lot of us imagine we're going to come out of our struggles. Like, I am awesome, and I just <laughs> defeated and conquered that thing, and I am a superhero. But most of the time, we come out of our struggles limping and leaning on God more than we ever have before. And that's how Jacob, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> that's how Jacob walks away from his wrestle, is leaning and limping and being defined by God in a way he never has before. And I think there's some people in the room where God's preparing them to walk out of a wrestling season, walk out of a struggling season, not feeling like a superhero, but feeling like the bride at the end of the story of Song of Solomon. It says this, it says, who is that coming up from the wilderness, leaning on her beloved. What would it look like for us to be a people that lean into God in the midst of our wrestle, lean into God in the midst of our struggle? And that's actually the third part that I want to pull out here is, is Jacob kind of looks back at this, this, this man, which we know to be God based on later in this text. And it says, and Jacob kind of asks him, well, well you told me my name, but what is your name? And, and, and the man says, um, the Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he says, why is it that you ask me my name? And there he blesses him. So Jacob's fight, do you catch this? Jacob's fight in the middle of the wrestle is to figure out what God's name is in that wrestle. Jacob's fight in the middle of the wrestle is to figure out how God is revealing himself in the midst of the struggle, which is the act of worship to identify who God is and, and respect and honor from that. This is what it looks like for Jacob to fight his battles, is to figure out who God is in the midst of it. And I think there's some deliverance that's coming for some of us this morning where, where we need to stop asking God to take us out of our struggle and start to figure out who God is in the middle of it. Because that's the good news. That's the good news of this book is not that God comes and delivers us out of our struggle. The good news of this book is that there's a man that stepped right into the middle of our struggle and died for us in the middle of it. That's the good news of this book. That's what Psalm 23 says, doesn't it? It says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you've delivered me from the valley? No, it says, because I am with you in the valley. And this is the good news of God for us this morning. He is the with us God. And if we know who God is, we know who we are and we are safe. We're protected. We're provided for. I'm going to invite somebody up to come on the keys, come play on the keys. I'm just going to show one more story and then we'll pray this morning. I think, I think God's talking to some hearts this morning. How many of you can feel God tugging on your heart this morning? So I want to share a story about, um, and maybe some of you have heard this story before, but there, there's a young man who grew up in Portland in the 1940s, and he had a gift and call of God on his life. He was a, a preacher, and many people told him, hey, you need to be a youth pastor, or you need to be a minister. And he said, you know what? My church is really well taken care of. There's a lot of pastors in America, but there's not a lot of pastors in the unreached people groups of Latin America. I'm going to go give my life to tell people about Jesus who don't know about him yet. So he gets, he's in his 20s, he's young, he moves to uh, Quito, um, and he, he actually meets there uh, some, an awesome girl who's a Bible translator, also coming from America. They get married, they're young, they're newlyweds, and one day they feel like it's time for them to go and make first contact with this people group. And they've heard rumors that this people group is a scary people group. They've heard rumors that they um, maybe even are cannibalistic, that they're just a really intense group. And so the, the guys decide they're going to go first and see what it's like. So they all get in a plane. I think we have a picture of that plane. Um, so they actually get on the plane, and they go uh, to the people group, and the people group ends up actually being that, um, that violent, and they, they actually get killed by this people group, and they, they, get, they get actually speared by the people group. Um, and this is, this is Jim Elliott, um, and this is his story. And so he dies trying to share the gospel with this group. But really the hero of this story, obviously these men are amazing heroes of which many of us will never measure up. But th there's another hero to this story, and it's, it's Jim Elliott's wife, Elizabeth, the Bible translator. And, and she actually decided um, that she wasn't going to just sit back when her husband lost his life for this. And she actually decides after her grieving period is over that she's going to stay in keto with her two-year-old daughter and with her friend and still go and tell, tell this people group about Jesus. So she goes back to the tribe that killed her husband 
and shares the gospel with them, translates the Bible into their language, and she sees a ton of them come to know Jesus, and there's a church in that people group now. But here's what this is a story about. It's about a woman who didn't let her circumstances and struggle define her. She didn't define herself as widow. I'm going to go back to America and grieve. She defined herself based on what God was saying about her, that she was a daughter of God, and she had an assignment to share about the good news of what her father had done for her. So let's stand up this morning. I think God's talking to some hearts, so we just want to create a space for this. And maybe God, maybe you don't feel like God's speaking something specifically to you quite yet, and that's what this space is for. Here's what I want to ask, just for maybe this is your first time of silence and rest and disconnection from all that stuff of life this week. Here's what I want to ask, just for five minutes. We're going we're gonna to create a space, and if God speaks to us, Uh, that maybe he would speak something to us this morning. So just close your eyes. Just close your eyes this morning. Thank you, Lord, for your presence that's in the room. Thank you, Lord, for your presence that's in this room. Well, thank you, Lord, for a people who are not going to be defined by their struggle and their circumstances, but people who are going to be defined by their Savior. Thank you, Lord, that you're with us in the middle of the wrestle, in the middle of the valley, in the middle of the trial. God, you're the with us, God. And God, we ask for boldness and courage to see you in the middle of the fights. Just with eyes closed, if you're saying, you know what, I'm going through a significant, difficult season right now, and it's hard to figure out where God is in it. Just lift your hand if that's you. Yeah, there's tons of hands all over the room. Lord, we just ask for grace this morning to see you for who you really are. I just feel, just for those hands that are lifted, I just feel a word of encouragement for you is as Jacob's wrestling with God in this story, it's not really clear that this man he's wrestling with is God until the very end. And even Jacob has to ask, what's your name? Like, who are you? What is going on? And I just feel like this morning, maybe there's some of you, you feel that same sort of confusion and where is God in the midst of it? And here's why we gather together as a community on Sunday mornings is so that we can remind each other who God is and where God is in the midst of it. So I actually want to pray for you that God would bring uh, brothers and sisters around you to lift you up. So Lord, we just pray uh, for, for a greater sense of community in this room, that those who feel like they're alone and isolated on the island would find the community that you have for them. So I just want to ask a couple questions this morning. The first question I want to ask is this, is what is the wrestle that you are in right now? What is the wrestle? What situation, what area is your wrestle? Maybe it's financial. Maybe it's a a friendship isn't going well. Maybe it's a marriage that's on the rocks. I even sense that there's some people in the room where your marriage um, has even felt dead, and that's the wrestle that you're in. Maybe you even feel like it died a long time ago, but what's that wrestle that you're in right now? I just wanted to create a space for all of us to engage with what God might be speaking to us. So just ask, ask yourself the question, ask the Holy Spirit the question, what's the wrestle that you're in right now? And thank you, Lord, for speaking across this room. And the second question I want to ask this morning is, what is God saying about who he is in the middle of that wrestle? What is God saying about who he is in the middle of the wrestle? And I just sense maybe there's some people in the room that feel like they can't hear the voice of God because the wrestle is so hard. So I just want to declare over some of us this morning, in the middle of your wrestle, God is the with us God. In the middle of our wrestle, God is the defender That's why we sing that song, Defender. It's not because we are awesome at fighting. It's because God's awesome at fighting, and he fights for us. He's the defender, God. It's who he is. I feel like some of us need to know this morning, God's the provider. It's who he is. He provides for us. He's the protector. That's who he is. So what is God saying about who he is in the middle of our wrestle this morning? And then the last question is this, is what is God saying about who you are? Because, beloved, this is the good news of the Bible. If we know who God is, we know who we are. If we know that he's a father, we know that we're sons and daughters. If we know he's a defender, we know that we're safe. If we know he's a provider, we know that we're provided for. So what is God saying about who you are in the midst of it? And here's what we're going to do this morning. Sometimes it's good 
just to say out loud what's going on in our lives. It's good to declare who God is. And I just feel like some of us, the enemy, that thief we talked about at the beginning has been speaking really, really loud. And you've been hearing those voices of accusation, those, those things, those wrestles, those struggles. You might feel like your struggle is so loud right now. And here's what you have to do is you have to say, I, as a son and daughter of God, I'm going to be louder than the voice of the enemy in my life. I'm going to let God's truth be louder than the voice of the enemy in my life. And sometimes what that looks like is not kind of cowering in fear in the corner and waiting for something to happen. Sometimes you have to walk forward and say, hey, God is my provider and I am provided for as a declaration saying, I'm not going to let the enemy be the loudest voice in my life anymore. Does that make sense? So here's what we're going to do. I'm just going to lead us and you can do this however you want to do it. You can put your hands out like this. You can lift your hands as like, this is my war cry. The only thing is there's no judgment, okay, about what the people next to you are going to do. So just, you can even turn to your neighbor and say, hey, I'm not going to judge you for how loud you're going to get right now. Just, you can just tell them right now. All right. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to lead you. I'm going to tell you exactly what to say, and it's going to be great. But if you need to lift your hands, if you need to get on your knees, we're dealing a death blow to the enemy this morning, where the enemy has been ruling and reigning. We say no more. Jesus is king. So here's what we're going to say. We're going to say, we're going to say, Father, Father, we believe. believe. And here's what we're going to do. I'm going to say that you are, and then you have to insert whatever that characteristic of God was, okay? So here we go. That you are. Come on, let's do it again. Father, we believe that you are. And we believe. And then we're going to do I am. And then you have to fill in the blank. That I am. Come on, we got to shout who we are. Say it again. Say, I am blank. Say, I am. Thank you, Lord. We silence the voice of the enemy this morning. God, we declare we are your victorious sons and daughters. God, we're not victims to our circumstances. We are victorious in you. And God, we thank you that you're right there in the middle of our wrestle this morning. So we love you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Can we just lift up a shout to Jesus this morning? Thank you, Jesus.